Come with us on a journey, a journey to a place where information is unlocked, knowledge is gained, and the exchange of experiences welcome. This is the Knowledge Exchange, presented by Lakeland Community College. So I'm gonna, there's a mix of stuff here, but basically the thrust of this material is like, what is modern acute stroke treatment in the hospital setting? And then I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna have a couple cases where people have done very well with treatment. And when I'm talking about treatment, I mean like the thrombolytic treatments to open up the arteries. And then um, we talk about um, stroke symptoms, of course, and then stroke risk factors. So that'll probably be the main thing, and hopefully I'll get done so soon enough so that we can have some questions. So first of all, like the scope of the problem, I mean, everyone knows that stroke is extremely common. Um, the, in the, now, I was trying to get this narrowed down. My wife was asking me, like, 18,000 strokes, <laughs> that's a lot of strokes. Was this in one year, and I actually tried to get this information from the stroke, stroke coordinator, and she didn't know. So I, all I know is that um, that's just the number that's there. So 67% um, are ischemic stroke. This is, again, the Cleveland area. And um, so only, so okay, this is one key thing. 5% are treated with IVTPA. And to back up, IVTPA stands for intravenous tissue plasminogen activator. So it's given through the vein, and it's a material that, um, it's a thrombolytic agent. So it's not just a blood thinner, like, you know, like warfarin, coumadin, Eliquis, those kinds of drugs. Those thin the blood. But they actually, the TPA is actually stronger. It actually breaks up clots. And it works for all types of strokes. Now, one of the problems is people don't recognize stroke symptoms, and so and they go to sleep, you know, they go back to sleep and say, well, maybe I slept on my arm wrong. And then in the morning, it's many, several hours later. Uh, so they miss the window for it. So 5% of those strokes were given IVTPA. So that's sort of very typical nationally, all around the world. Only about 5% people get IVTPA, and because they are outside the time window. Um, two percent got endovascular treatment, and I'm going to talk about that. That's where they actually put a catheter into an artery that has a blood clot in it, and typically a middle cerebral artery, internal carotid artery, and then they actually, they actually, it's a mechanical thing. They actually pull the clot out, and they open it up, and they restore circulation. So uh, 20 percent of strokes resolved, and they call these TIAs, and um, TIA stands for transient or temporary ischemic attacks. And that gets to be confusing terminology, but basically a mini stroke, something that clears up within typically 20, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, that would be a TIA, as opposed to a stroke where your, your neurological deficit's, you know, 24 hours or more. That's like the typical uh, definition. 13% were hemorrhagic, meaning there was a bleed, primary hemorrhage in the brain. 6,600 were subarachnoid hemorrhage, which means the bleed was on top, you know, outside the brain. And then 1,700 were inside the brain. <clears throat> those I'm not going to talk about, really. But sometimes those... Well, typically those are uh, transferred down to one of the major medical centers, and often neurosurgeons get involved. Sometimes they have to have surgery to drain the blood. Um, now, uh, this is not that interesting, but basically there's three types of facilities that you might go to if you had a stroke or a family member or a friend had a stroke. So one would be what we call a stroke-ready facility, and that would be like an emergency room, self-standing emergency room like an Andover, it's way near Pennsylvania, all they have is an emergency room there. They do, they can treat, that, when I say stroke ready, that means they can give IV TPA and then they could ship the patient to a, a primary stroke center or even a major stroke center. Primary stroke centers would be like Geauga, uh, Lake uh, West, TriPoint, which are closer to here, and then the comprehensive, those, those, okay, so those facilities can treat with intravenous TPA, and then comprehensive stroke centers would be ones that can give the uh, vascular, endovascular type treatment as well as IV TPA. 
Okay, again, this is epidemiology, 795,000 strokes per, per year in the United States. And we t you'll see that purple area there. Uh, those are uh, in the southeast. They call that the stroke belt. And they talked about that when I did my stroke fellowship. You know, for some reason, there's a higher incidence of stroke there, probably because of the higher black population, the higher blood pressure, which is the most important risk factor for stroke, and obesity. So it just maybe smoking, but they all t combine together to make it a more, off, more frequent occurrence down there. Um, now, death from strokes has dropped over the last several years, uh, but it's still the leading cause of disability in adults. So I'm just giving you the scope of the problem so you understand the importance of it. Now, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide because it's too busy. But basically, we have guidelines like every, every other hospital system and how people are treated for stroke. And um, so there's medical care and, you know, when you do imaging studies, when you do neurological assessments and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to skip that one, like I said, because I don't think it's, I can't go over it really. I can't even see it. <laughs> but, um, anyway, um, so... Okay, so there's two things that we want to do. We want to recognize strokes suddenly, and we want to determine the type of stroke, and then what's, whether they would qualify for intravenous TPA. So we want to establish the time of onset, which means the last time that patient was known well. So if they went to bed at 11 o'clock, and they woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, they can't talk, and they're, they're paralyzed on one side, the last known time would be 11. You have to go back to the last time they were seen normal. If they live alone, that makes it very difficult, of course. Then, you know, so no one's seen them. You don't know when it started. So those, those would be fallouts. I mean, you, you just can't treat them with the IV TPA. Um, so I already mentioned this, medical treatments. We give treatment when they're admitted, uh, try to prevent clots from forming in their legs. We go the blood thin well, low level blood thinning. And we do, um, of course, diagnostic testing and like MRI, the artery of uh, the brain and the arteries, MRA, and then uh, ultrasound of the heart and cardiac monitoring, and then there's neuro checks and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's go on here. Um, so, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's different types of strokes. 80% of strokes actually are just ischemic stroke, which means that a part of the brain didn't, didn't get enough blood flow for a period of time. And that causes damage to that stroke, I mean to that brain. Um, so typically it's a sudden onset, but that's not you know, universal, universal, excuse me. Some people will say, well, I started to have something in the morning, then it got worse during the day, and so I decided to go to the emergency room at five o'clock in the afternoon. You know, you can have a stuttering onset is what I'm trying to say, not just sudden onset. Uh, with stroke, regular ischemic stroke, you can't have a headache. You can, um, generally you don't have de depressed consciousness, so people usually are awake. Um, the bleed in the brain is usually a progressive problem and it's usually associated with severe headache, and they usually are very, um, they could be comatose, they could be very lethargic, but they are decreased in their level of consciousness. The subarachnoid hemorrhage, classically, is the worst headache of their life. They can pass out, go into a coma if it's severe. Now, how do you diagnose these things right off the bat in the emergency room? So in the emergency room, they will always do a CAT scan of the head first, without contrast because that will identify someone with a bleed. Because they want to know, like I said, they're trying to determine if someone is going to qualify for intravenous TPA. So if they have focal neurological deficits and their CAT scan is negative for a bleed and they're not on a blood thinner like warfarin and they're, all those sorts of things, they look at the blood pressure, all that stuff, then they might be a candidate for it, for the intravenous TPA. If they have a bleed, obviously that disqualifies them. All right, um, like I said, the subarachnoids, the interstitial hemorrhages typically go to the tertiary hospitals. Now, um, I've already sort of talked about the TIAs already. Um, why is that important to, to recognize it? Well, they should, okay, so typically, like in our hospital system, the patient is admitted in a 23-hour observation. The studies have shown that a quick workup is, is very helpful for identifying something that could lead to a stroke in a short period of time. 
40% of TI patients will actually go on and have a stroke. And so that's a very high percentage. Um, so they're admitted to the hospital, but it's just a temporary admission usually. But now, a certain percentage of those patients will actually, the MRI will be done, it will show a stroke. So then it becomes a stroke, and they're usually kept longer. But that's kind of funny. You don't think that would be, you know, in other words, if you thought everything cleared up, you wouldn't normally think that they had a stroke. But it does happen, like, up to 30 40% of the time. Uh, now, these are red flag features. So basically, um, if they have a very severe headache, the collapse, their nausea, vomiting, that would suggest maybe a bleed. Uh, if they had a seizure, that would be often associated with strokes, not necessarily more urgent, but it would need to be treated. Uh, blood thinners make a difference, of course, then they can't get certain the, the IV TPA, like I mentioned. Um, so it's like normal ER stabilization of patients, uh, you know, you look at the, make sure that they're circulating, I mean, they have normal blood pressure, oxygenation is good, elevate the blood uh, head to 30 degrees. Um, I'm gonna go ahead here. Um, okay, so if the blood pressure is low, that's not a sign of stroke. I guess I, that would, I would say that. So normally your blood pressure is either gonna be normal or high. So most people with a stroke will have a high blood pressure. So I'm talking about like 200 systolic, and now we know that we don't want to lower that blood pressure unless they are given that thrombolytic agent because it might make their stroke worse. So we, th we think now that it's a protective mechanism for the body. So like, like if you had a stroke, your blood pressure would run high and maybe increase the blood flow to that area that's been damaged, so it may be protective. So at least for the two or three days in the hospital, we frequently just let them have a higher blood pressure. We call that permissive hypertension. Okay, so if someone's had a bleed, then we do control the blood pressure uh, tightly. That would be a different situation. Um, okay, now let's see here. Uh, low blood sugar, okay, so this is one thing. We're gonna talk about this, but there are things that look like a stroke, but they're not. So if someone has a really low blood sugar, they can actually look like they've had a stroke. So you give them sugar, glucose, D50, whatever, and then, yeah, and then their symptoms resolve. Um, okay, so basically what it says here is NIH stroke scale, and I will mention this, but I'm not gonna go over it. The NIH stroke scale is a standard measure of uh, stroke deficits used by doctors and nurses in this country and probably around the world. So basically, um, when, the, uh, when, when this uh, TPA was approved in the, with a positive study in 1995, um, they used the NIH stroke scale as a way to, to measure it. And basically what it means is like you look at certain things, like what's the level of consciousness, can they talk, can they read, can they see things, name things, and is, do they have weakness, all that stuff. So you come up with a score, the, hops, top, the highest score would be 42. The higher the score, the worse the stroke. So we use it to help with prognosis, and we also, like I, my own personal practice, like someone has a score of seven or eight, it's less likely they're gonna be able to live independently in 90 days, that's how I use it. But it's used in the ED to help determine whether someone qualifies for IV TPA, for example. You'd want at least a score of maybe a four, but sometimes you use two, like if they, have, they can't talk properly, a lot of times they are treating these people, even though the score isn't very high because that inability to talk is a pretty se severe deficit. I mean, you imagine having a stroke and then you can't talk for the rest of your life, I think I'd be willing to take the risk of the intravenous TPA, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Can you, all right, the score. Yeah. What's the score again? Well, uh, the whole thing's called an NI, NIH stroke scale, okay? That stands for National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. So it was developed under the Aegis, is that okay. how you pronounce it? Right, right. Of the NIH National Institute of Health. So when, that, when they did that stroke study, they needed something to, 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 to measure people's objectively, the stroke deficits. So they could compare. So I could compare, I saw a stroke patient with a score of five and you have one with eight. 
chances are the one with an eight is gonna be worse off than the one with the five. Okay, so what is the low scale, one or zero? The, the, the normal, okay, normal would be zero. Okay. But I will give you one more example of this sort of and thing. Then, then when you said like if it's a nine, that person is gonna be. Oh, okay, all right. Well, okay, so first of all, let me just tell you, the score is not the end all be all, okay? Because I had a guy who had a stroke and his score was zero, but when I tried to get him up to walk, he couldn't walk properly. He was off balance, you know, his legs were really right. off balance. So he had a score of zero, but he couldn't walk. So that would be considered, you know, a significant neuro deficit. Now, as far as, well, oh, oh, I'm saying that this has been tested to help with prognosis. So what they would do is they would look at a number of people, what's their scores, and they'd look at them 90 days later, 90 days, 30, 90 days are a typical time frames that you look at people again to see how they're doing. But bottom line is everyone who comes in for the stroke is going to get a score. Right. And so what is like the like, hey, you are in great danger score, 10? Well, the higher this, all I can say is this. Okay, so first of all, there's a couple factors, three factors at least, four factors. So one is what caused the stroke? What is it a bleed or not bleed? Two, how old is the patient? So if they're 90 years old and they have a higher score, that, that would be harder for them to recover from that than a 20-year-old or 30-year-old. So, okay, so the score, the va it does have value, but it doesn't, it's not absolute. Like, so I use it, like I said, in my practice, like if I'm seeing people, I might say, okay, your score today was four, so I think there's a good chance that even with physical therapy rehab, you would be able to go home and live pretty independently. Whereas if it's a nine or 10, that is high enough that, you know, you have to know what the deficits are, of course. Uh, you know, uh, if they're having trouble thinking, communicating, and they can't walk, that would be like a devastating type thing. But that would, you know, so, the, so the, the numbers are not absolute in the sense that you don't know what's wrong with the person just by giving them that number. You have to, but there is other, so when I look at a note in, from the emergency room, typically we'll say, patient presented with trouble walk, um, talking and a facial droop, NI stroke scale, let's say was four or something, and then they got better. Or, and then they got the NI, then they got the IV TPA or something, and then they had complete recovery. So different things can happen just because they present that way to the emergency room doesn't mean they're going to be permanently in that situation. But the numbers are the best thing that we have. You know, otherwise we're going to have to write it out in narrative form, like what does the patient have, and then try to get an idea from that. So it's, it's what's used, like I said, typically in, in drug trials and stuff to determine the severity of the strokes. All right. Um, I think I did cover everything. Okay. <laughs> um, by the way, BAT, stroke alert, stroke alert is the same as brain attack team. Okay? Actually, I didn't know what BAT meant. I looked it up a couple days ago because I don't use that terminology. But it's like a heart attack, like uh, what's the other term? What's the term we use when someone has like they do rapid response? You know, that would mean like emergency to assess the patient. Okay. Stroke mimics, I want to go through this, because this is important. Um, I'm going to start off with migraine, because migraine I see very frequently in the hospital. So p people may or may not have a history of migraine, but when I go in there and I talk to them, they say they start out with numbness in the hand, it goes up the arm, and then they had dizziness, and then they had weakness, and then maybe they had a headache, okay? And then it resolved. So anyway, migraine can cause stroke-like symptoms. Now, it could be psychogenic, which means people are, they don't really have a stroke. That doesn't really happen very often, honestly. Uh, seizure, this is a very important one. So like someone who had a stroke 10 years ago, they, let's say their stroke affected the right side, they could be found to have right-sided weakness at home. Their, their spouse did not realize that they had had a seizure, but they are found to have weakness. So I've had that happen a couple times in the last six months. So I'll see the patient, and then I actually take the good history, and then they tell me that, yeah, th that that's what happened. Then they got better, 
And then, of course, they do an MRI and everything. It just shows the old stroke. So what I'm trying to say is the aftermath of seizures can look like a stroke. That's what I'm trying to say. The low blood sugar, I talked about, of course, uh, drug intoxications. Um, you know, you could have kidney failure, inability to breathe, uh, heart problems. Dementia would be, with delirium means like a confusional state due to infection. Uh, passing out could look like a stroke. Okay, so literally we see people in the hospital all the time who have uh, been at work, let's say, and they collapse and, and it's thought to be maybe a stroke, but then it turns out they're, they're fine, their MRI is negative and everything. So that would be hard to diagnose. Syncope doesn't, you can't really diagnose it really very well. It's, it's like, um, well, I don't want to get too far here, but TIA is the same way. It's just basically based on a history and then you have everything's negative a lot of times. Okay, um, spinal cord would mean like if you had a compression or something in your spinal cord, you could have, or, or a nerve problem. So we see people who have numbness in their arm and it's not due to a stroke, it's due to just like a pinched nerve. All right, uh, so we're gonna talk about this quickly here. Now, IVTPA was approved in 1995. It was the first time it was approved and there was a lot of skepticism about it. People didn't like it. Doctors, I'm talking about ER particularly, why didn't they like it? Well, they weren't impressed with the numbers. And the particularly, like, so someone would be, um, so a lot of these patients, they didn't found that it was helpful within 24 hours. How could a drug be helpful and it doesn't help them within 24 hours? They didn't find that 30% had reduced risk of disability, and that was at, uh, was it 90 days? I think it's 90 days. So, again, you think if a drug was really working that well, it would you could see that effect right off the bat. Uh, minimizes the so so you have a better outcome in 30% of patients, okay, and then uh, better functional outcome, less disability. But there is about a 6.5% chance of bleeding. So it's a downside, and like I said, I would personally take that chance if I was in that situation. But there is a small, there is a risk of bleeding, but most of the time, if there is bleeding, it's not devastating or anything. Um, so, had been less than three hours, so if someone had a stroke within three hours, the symptoms last known well, then you could give that medication, you know, if you didn't have any of the exclusion criteria, which would recent surgery, blood thinner, that sort of thing, um, you know, uncontrolled blood pressure. Um, now they have increased it. As it says there, 30, 3 to 4.5 hours. But if it's the longer time, you can't have, be older than 80, have a really high NI stroke scale. And let me say this before I forget. Um, some, there has been some controversy about where you should go when you have a, a stroke. You know, like some, some doctor, some stroke specialists have recommended that you just go to, you know, main campus at UH or Cleveland Clinic or Metro and then rather than going to the community hospital first. Well, they did have, have done studies and they found that people that are treated quicker with the IVTPA, then if they get the other treatment, you know, they get transferred and then they get the other treatment, they have a better outcome. So it doesn't necessarily improve outcome to go directly to a tertiary hospital. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, all right, diabetic, well, yeah. So like if it's greater than three hours to 4.5 hours, you can't get that. So what happens uh, let's say someone goes to the emergency room and we know that it was more than 4.5 hours. And let's say they have a, a high NIH stroke scale, at least let's say eight, something like that. Then they, they can do a, a, a test called a CT angiography test, which is similar to an MRA, but it uses contrast with CAT scan technology. But they can see if there's a blockage. If there's a blockage, then they can send the patient right down to, um, like I said, the main campus of UH or Cleveland Clinic and then they can get that treatment. So I don't want you to think that they have to have the IVTPA in order to get the other one. Sometimes people don't qualify for the first one because it's too late or some other reason. So there is, okay, so I don't want to get too far <laughs> off base here. So I'm gonna keep going here. Um, all right, so I already talked about this. Basically, it was approved in 95 and it has become more popular over time 
doctors have more accepted it. It used to be an ER doctor wouldn't even treat someone with IVTP unless there was a neurologist to come in and see the patient. Could you imagine that? Getting a call at 2 in the morning, they want you to come in and see a patient before they'll give this treatment. Well, the reason I'm saying this is because now it's, stan it's considered standard treatment and they will give the treatment, you know, if they can talk to a, a neurologist on the phone. So the idea behind um, this thrombolytic treatment is that there is um, a core area of tissue which has been damaged by the stroke. And then surrounding that is what we call a penumbra. So that's like a stunned, uh, I'm sorry, the cells are damaged, but they're not dead. The term used in biology is necrosis. You probably heard that. So necrosis, so the, the, the inner core, you can't really do anything about. But there is surrounding tissue that if you restore that blood flow, the person will have a better outcome and often reverse their neurological um, uh, outcome or deficits. Um, okay, now what, what, is, what are these numbers here? So basically, this is incredible, but basically, this, this looks very modest actually. But okay, so someone goes to the emergency room, they want a doctor to see the patient within 10 minutes. Um, door to neuro expertise means like 15 minutes that the doctor talks to somebody, uh, not necessarily myself, but somebody who's um, like at the main campus, they call them a stroke specialist. I'm, I'm, I'm trained in stroke, but I don't, tr I don't triage people for uh, the, the, the uh, endovascular treatment. Anyway, they get the CAT scan read within uh, 30 to 45 minutes. They get, we'd like to have everybody treated within 60 minutes. And definitely we're between 45 and 60 at this time. So I mean, in other words, when we, we have monthly stroke meetings and we go over all the cases of stroke and how long it takes them to treat with IVTPA, and that's our goal. Again, time is brain. The quicker you treat people, the better the outcome, whether it's with IVTPA or with the endovascular treatment. They've done studies on this. You have to trust me. Even that original study in 1995, they found people treated within 90 minutes had a better outcome than those we're treated in three hours. All right, so, okay. So this is like, what do you, how do you get someone, I sort of said this already, talked about that, you know, like what would exclude you from getting that treatment. Now these are CAT scans. So, um, so normally when you do a CAT scan of the head, this is older technology, uh, but it's x-rays basically of your brain but you can pick up bleeds. If someone had an older stroke, it would show up on that. So what this shows is on, on the left-hand side is, is normal, right? So normally if someone comes in and it hasn't been very long since a stroke, they would have a normal CAT scan. Now, if after several hours, if you did the CAT scan, you might see that, um, can you see that area there? I don't know, up here. So this is, that's a recent, uh, ischemic stroke here. So there's, there's, there's a difference in the color appearance there. And then the last one shows the dark, very dark imaging there. That's somebody who had a stroke like weeks ago or months ago. So this just shows you what, what do you get out of a CAT scan basically. <coughs> um, now I've already showed you one early sign there. Now um, I'm sorry, this is Hyperintense, what is this thing here? This is what we call hyperintense middle cerebral artery. So the middle cerebral artery is on both sides of your brain and it's like the main blood supply to the front of your brain, okay? So like for speech, communication, that sort of thing. Um, so sometimes on a CAT scan you'll see that. What does that mean? Well that means probably you have a complete blockage or occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. So sometimes, you, you don't see that, of course, uh, so you have to do a, a further studies, but uh, these, both of these show, the other two images just show how the CAT scan evolves. Now, the aspects I can't really talk to you about, but too much, but if you look on the MRI one there, it shows you, um, that's called um, DWI, diffusion imaging, and that shows you what a stroke looks like really early on. And that would, that might appear and you wouldn't see anything on the CAT scan. Uh, now, 
you may say, well, why don't we just get an MRI in everybody when the first thing when they come in? Well, again, time is brain. We're trying to see if someone should get IV TPA. So we always do the CAT scan first to rule out a bleed. Then um, we go from there. If they get the, the IV TPA, well, you do that. But then there's a CTA which is done and asks to see if there's a blockage. If there's a blockage and the patient has significant neurological deficits, then they would be transferred down to a main campus to get um, probable the, you know, the endovascular treatment. So I'm not going to read that. I can't even see it myself, actually. Exclusion, eight, well, whatever. Um, OK, so what this says is that um, if you treat 100 patients less than three hours from their stroke, 32 benefit and three are harmed. That's basically comes off the 30% have improvement and 6.5% have a bleed. So that's your numbers. So that's what we tell people, you know, come to the emergency room, you know, if the person can't communicate, you know, we ask them, you know, make a decision for them. And then most of the time, people will opt for that treatment, but there is a little bit of risk with it. You have 32 benefit, three are harmed out of 100 patients. So 32 and three is 35. What about the other 65? Oh, well, the rest of them, there's no change. So when they do a follow-up uh, exam on these patients, they are not changed. So they're not benefited and they're not harmed necessarily. So it's not, like I said, initially when this, was, this drug was released, people weren't too excited about it, you know, in the sense they weren't overwhelmed with the numbers. But it did show a statistical improvement, uh, a higher likelihood of a favorable outcome. That's what it basically shows. Uh, so basically, just so you understand, if someone got this medication, then they would be admitted to an intensive care unit, and then the neuro checks are done every 15 minutes for two hours, and every three minutes, uh, 30 minutes for six hours, hourly for 16 hours. Basically, it's for 24 hours. So I just want you to understand that they do monitor patients very carefully. Why are they monitoring? Just to make sure that they haven't had a bleed or something. If they start to have new symptoms, then they would run them down and get a CAT scan with, uh, to, without contrast to relative bleed. And then they keep their blood pressure uh, less than um, 180 over 105. Um, okay, so this slide shows that you're more likely to have a better outcome if you are less than 70, you have a normal CAT scan, less severe neurological deficit, which is kind of logical, uh, absence of diabetes, hypertension, or heart disease. So basically, a very healthy person, less than 70. So poor outcome if your NIH stroke scale is greater than 20 and your CAT scan starts to show a stroke on it, you know, showing a, a new stroke, and you have hypertension or diabetes and your blood sugar is high. Like sometimes we see people who have not even taken care of themselves, haven't seen a doctor for 10 years, and they have uncontrolled high blood pressure and diabetes. They're not going to do as well. So it's kind of logical. Um, if they're older, more than 80, then they're more likely to have a bleed from the TPA. And if, they're str if their NIH stroke scale is higher, and then you're having early signs of a stroke, they have dementia, uncontrolled hypertension. So these are kind of logical, but it's something to think about. All right, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, not going to talk about this. OK, so the end of therapy, what is that? Well, Basically, they have to find a clot and a blockage in one of the major arteries that do well. For some reason, some arteries don't do well with this kind of treatment. And basically, what they do is they put a, a, a catheter in the blood vessels and it goes up into the brain area, and they look for a clot. And they look for the well. I'm sorry. First, they do the CTA, CT angiography test. There is a blockage in the middle cerebral artery or the intracranial, inter, intracerebral ar or intracranial artery, ICA, then those arteries would be good for getting um, the clot out. So, uh, so you can have the IV TPA. Um, your NIH stroke has to be at least six. I said eight earlier, but it actually is six. And then they would like to treat them within six hours of the onset. So that was the actually 
I don't want to confuse you, but that was the initial guidelines. They have had really exciting studies. There have been two studies in the last year, let's say. One of them was actually the Dawn study that was actually part of CASE. And they found that up to 24 hours after last known well, those patients did have improvement with this uh, endovascular therapy if they had a blockage. So you have to understand, some people have a stroke and they don't find a blockage. So that's all. That's, they can't do anything if they came in that late. But these people, they found that they did improve even up to 24 hours after the onset. So this is really, I think, exciting because so many people, um, you know, put off going to the ER. They don't recognize the symptoms early. And so this is really making a big difference. Uh, but having said that, they did do a study, I mean, when they did this study, the data shows that each hour reduces the likelihood that it's going to help. And I think I have that uh, later in a second here. So these are the endovascular trials. So for many years, they kept working on this, working on it, trying to find this to work. And they, they offered it to people, but they didn't really have any data to support it. Well, back in 2015, there were five randomized studies which showed that it, it helped when it was treated, uh, used MCA occlusion within six hours. And then they've had uh, the, the two recent studies that I told you about, which is a longer time frame, time frame, I should say. Now, let's see here. Um, so they're saying here, um, if you give someone IV TPA and you have the endovascular therapy, you're 40% more likely to be successful. Time is everything. Okay, this is what I wanted to tell you. So every 30 minute de delay in time to doing an endovascular treatment translates to a 10% decline in the probability of a good functional outcome, which is pretty amazing. 30 minutes, 10% decline. So, so we still, even though it is up to 24 hours, you're much better off getting it at say 10 hours or eight hours or six hours than waiting that full amount. But at least we can offer people something, you know. So this is the uh, visual aids. Okay, I have to, okay. So basically, um, if uh, you were treated within six hours of stroke, every, for 100 patients, and they get this endovascular treatment, who don't get the IV TPA, 54 benefit. So that's more than 50%. So that's interesting. Um, the first one is with both of them. Now, I don't understand that, actually. You know, why would it only be 34 and the other one's 54? I don't know. I, don't, I actually can't explain that to you because I would think that uh, Maybe, maybe, it's, uh, maybe they have more s severe strokes if they get both treatments. That's possible. Okay. Okay, so this is one key slide. So when someone gets admitted to the hospital, we try to figure out what caused the stroke, obviously, uh, which goes for TIAs as well. You know, so there are different causes here. Um, I would draw your attention to the one on the upper right, lacunar. That means like the little tiny arteries in your brain. So those get clogged up like, um, you know, like rust in a pipe or something. And all of a sudden, there's no way to predict this is going to happen. They just all of a sudden, they have a stroke. So typically, these cause like weakness, weakness and numbness, trouble with walking, something like that. Usually does not cause trouble like with getting the words out or understanding or confusion. So it usually has a good prognosis. But I want you to understand, this is just due to a tiny artery blockage. It's not due to anything with a heart or a larger artery. So the next one down is dissection, which is seen more in younger people. But basically, it means like the inner part of the wall just peels off like that. And that can cause strokes as well. That's typically treated with blood thinner. And then there's atrial fibrillation, which um, in cardiomyopathy, basically, so you can get, let's just say someone doesn't even know they have atrial fibrillation and all of a sudden they develop it over the weekend and it's what we call paroxysmal. So come, they come in and out. Well, they can have a stroke from that. Mm -hmm. So the clot forms in the heart and then it goes up to the brain and causes a stroke. That's probably, besides hypertension, that's the most common cause of stroke um, in older people particularly. And this is something that's silent. You know, you wouldn't know about it. 
you know, you're not necessarily going to have palpitations or chest pain. And when that happens, um, they tend to be larger strokes. But the other thing is, if you did a study, you would see clots all over. And I think I do have a slide to show that. Um, valvular disease. OK, so these are all problems with the heart. You can have a hole in the heart. That's what patent foramen of valley is. And now we're knowing that that could probably be treated with uh, blood thinner. Um, you could have a, a plaque on your aortic arch, and that can cause strokes. Um, large artery blockages. OK, so you've heard of carotid artery disease, and people have surgery for that, right? So those, those sometimes cause strokes. Uh, sometimes you can have blockages up here in the brain, um, larger arteries. So, so the main causes of stroke would be the heart, large arteries, tiny arteries, or not, or no cause identified. Oh, I'm sorry. Other causes would be like, um, you know, like people with, um, we call it a hypercoagulable condition. Their, their blood tends to clot together, a clot inappropriately, let's put it that way. Like the Leiden 5, or factor 5 Leiden factor. So th they have that in their bloodstream, or in their body, and that causes their, their blood to clot, and so they have to be on a blood thinner lifelong. Or lupus, you know, lupus can cause strokes. Um, migraine increases your risk a little bit. Um, Sickle cell anemia is a big cause of strokes in younger people. So um, I'm giving you, these are like what I would call miscellaneous causes of stroke. And then there's unidentified. Now, unidentified means that after extensive workup, we can't determine the cause. So a lot of people will leave the hospital, we don't know what the cause is, and we'll, let them, we'll ask them to follow up with a cardiologist and have a, like a two weeks of uh, cardiac monitor to see if they have paroxysmal atrial fib. So I, the whole point is here is we try to figure out the cause and then we're going to talk about risk factors as well in a minute. But that's basically it. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do now, I wanted to call, uh, go over this. Um, there's two cases. The first one I think is more impressive, okay? I don't know, you probably can't, Oh, you can probably read that better than I can read this. But a 49-year-old woman, which she has a history of diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking. So she has risk factors for stroke. She suddenly developed left upper extremity weakness and slurred speech while driving. She's able to drive home, which is amazing. Her roommate caused, called 911. And then EMS took her to Jaga Hospital, called... Um, oh, like, uh, well, you know what I'm talking about, a bat, the <laughs> stroke team. Anyway, so her NIH stroke scale, well, first of all, CAT scan was negative for bleed. NIH stroke scale was 6. Her blood pressure was 121 over 74. Blood sugar was high. They gave her um, Altaplase, which is the IV TPA. And her NIH stroke scale improved, but then she got worse. So she was transferred to the main campus of UH. They did a, CAT, a CT angiography test. Nowadays, we would do it right at the hospital there, but they transferred, I guess, first. And the right middle cerebral artery was blocked. So she was immediately taken to the angio suite, and they had clout retrieval, and they did a successful mechanical thrombectomy. And um, so she was discharged home on aspirin and statin, and I stroke scale was one. Now, I don't know what her particular deficit, it might have been mild weakness or something, but a score of one is very mild. You can, I'm sure you can imagine that. But anyway, so if you look at those um, images there, it will show you that on the left-hand side um, that you can't, uh, it doesn't fill out as well. Uh, is the right, and so they restored, so basically her middle tube artery was not perfusing, so this was damaged blood, uh, brain. So they gave this, they did this treatment, and then it restored the flow, she had a good outcome, she was able to go home, she didn't even have to go to rehab. So the take home lesson here is, I wanted to point out that the door to IV TPA time on her was 15 minutes. So just think about that. That means the EMS called the ER, told them about them. She comes in, they look her over, they do a CAT scan, they do all the blood work, 
and they treated her within 15 minutes of arrival. I mean, I think that's really profound. You know, I mean, that's the importance of having, you know, like rapid assessment. Any questions on that? No, I'm not sharing with you like bad cases. I'm just showing you what the ideal situation would be. Now this one, I'm not gonna go over the details, but this patient here um, also had a mechanical thrombectomy. This guy, um, oh, I don't know, it doesn't say his age, I don't think. But anyway, he had a dissection on the left side and left MCA syndrome, but his, his arteries opened up. You know, you can see that they filled up. So um, not everybody, like I said, has a, a blockage of an artery that can be treated. Um, so this one, I'm not going to go over because basically, well, the anion strokes, okay, so this patient was treated with um, intravenous TPA and um, had a medullary cerebral artery occlusion on the left side. When was treated with um, thrombectomy as well as the initial treatment, like I said. Anyway, his anion stroke scale went from a um, 60-year-old man. It went from uh, uh, 37 to 17. So he has significant improvement, and then 20, I guess, eventually. So really, the, you know, without getting into too much redundant here, it just, you can have a good outcome from stroke, but it is important to recognize the stroke symptoms. And now this is just a hemorrhage, which is, uh, you know, treated differently. I'm not going to do this one. Uh, basically, it's what I said. With some people, we are uh, doing the CTA at a local hospital like Giaga, and then what happens is if they don't have a blockage, we, do, we just keep them there. And if they do have a blockage, then we send them to the main campus. They don't want the patient if there's no blockage to treat. Uh, this basically shows the MRI, like a, a, in minutes, shows a stroke. It's very, very, very sensitive. But there's no advantage of that over um, a CAT scan if you're just ruling out a bleed. Now, I just want to point out on this one that, um, that on that right side it says multifocal cardioembolism. Uh, that is an example of somebody, let's say, who has atrial fibrillation and they have little clots in different parts of the brain. And that will show up on that. So we see that frequently. And that tells us that the patient didn't have a, a single blockage. It's, it's due to like a little shower of clots. So um, let's see here. Um, OK. So I want, the, the, just to conclude here, we're going to talk just briefly about recognizing stroke symptoms and risk factors for stroke, what you can do. So basically, stroke symptoms um, are hard to recall all of them. You know, it could be as many as 10. but. The main things, like for the public, we've had, they have this thing called FAST, which stands for face, arm, speech, time. So basically, if you see facial drooping, if you have arm weakness, speech difficulty, then those are reliable symptoms of stroke, and you would call 911. That's what the T is for. So there are other stroke symptoms, okay? Obviously, they, you could have numbness, you could have trouble getting, you could have, um, trouble walking. The worst headache of your life, obviously, should go to the emergency room because that could be a bleed. So, um, so what we're trying to do, I think, is keep it simple. But the main thing is a lot of people just don't think it's important. And I think with the, value, with the new treatments that we have or the new criteria for treatment, that there is more value to getting to the hospital earlier rather than, I mean, it used to be really literally in my lifetime, people with a stroke would be put in the corner of an emergency room, and they would have a lower priority. Uh, but now we know that you can't do that. You can't treat people that way. That's not the best care. So that's the main thing I think people should realize, that there are valuable acute street stroke treatments. Now, as far as um, recognizing or treatment, what are the stroke risk factors, right? So is anyone, why doesn't someone give some of the risk factors for stroke based on what I've talked about that you can recognize that um, we can just start, use as a starting point here. Okay, so that's number one, yep. Diabetes. Yep. Advanced age. age. Yeah. What'd you say? Age. Age, yeah, okay, right. 
So at one person, at 70, age 70, a man has a 1% chance of having a stroke every year without anything else. And you can go on, just so I don't forget, you can go on the computer and you look up stroke risk factors or formula for determining my risk of stroke, and you can plug in what your risk factors are and you can get a number from them. Okay? I'm sorry, did you say one? No, I said age at the same time he did. <laughs> Smoking. Yeah. Smoking, for sure, yeah. Previous TIA. Right. Or stroke. Yeah. So, heart disease? Genetics? Yeah, genetics. So, we always ask, do we have a family history of stroke? That is for sure. I agree with that. So, when is one, I want to give you one that you might not think about. Um, there's just recent publicity about this, obstructive sleep apnea. So up to 50% of the population has um, obstructive sleep apnea. And, you know, it's been underdiagnosed in the past. Well, now we know that it is a risk factor for stroke. So if you have obstructive sleep apnea, you know somebody, they definitely want to have that treated because it's going to increase your risk of having a stroke. Um, now, cholesterol is also another one. Uh, there's bad cholesterol and there's good cholesterol. The good cholesterol is HDL, bad cholesterol, LDL. I say sometimes lousy cholesterol, but it stands for low density cholesterol. But that number should be less than 100 for sure. Um, now, I'm going to sort of, okay, so also I'll just run through the rest of them. Alcohol, um, it should not be more than a drink a day. Um, for men and women. It used to be two drinks for men, one for women. Now they've lowered it to one for men. Um, we talked about, okay, okay, hormone therapy not recommended for a woman if she's had a stroke. Um, weight management, your BMI should, you know, be within the normal limits. And you should be active, exercise. So what they recommend is three or four times a week, um, 30 minutes. And that's true for actually the mind itself as far as making, you know, lowering your risk of dementia. Believe it or not, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I think it, it means that things like Alzheimer's might be uh, vascular in nature to a certain extent. And so we're learning more and more about that. But uh, exercise is important. Uh, we talked about cholesterol. And then if you had a carotid artery problem, now you may say, well, I don't normally have my carotids checked unless there's a problem, which is true. Now you can do that, what is it, life what is it called? Life uh, span? Not life span. There's a thing that you can you can buy. You can pay for it. I'm sorry, like $150, and you can have like your carotids checked. You can look for aortic aneurysm. Uh, I don't know EKG. They check your arteries and your legs, that sort of thing. But I mean, I don't think insurance companies just let you just get a carotid ultrasound exam. That's what I'm trying to say. So. Um, so one more, almost finished here. So 30% of stroke survivors will have another stroke within five years, 18% will be fatal. Okay, so that's pretty glum news. But basically, um, what do we do? So as far as medications, there is no prescription drug, of course, which is a guarantee. But if you have atrial fib, you should be on a blood thinner. That will reduce your risk by 75 or 80%. Like I'm talking about Eliquis or uh, Warfarin, that sort of thing. And then um, aspirin. So I just read this recently, and this is discouraging, but primary prevention of stroke, they didn't find it to be helpful to take a baby aspirin. <laughs> so that's kind of discouraging because, you know, it's over the counter. It's like always take baby aspirin, right? <laughs> People have stroke symptoms and they start taking the aspirin, you know. Um, but it didn't say anything about after you've had a stroke. So you could still take an aspirin afterwards. Now, the one thing I do want to emphasize is that with, with um, a statin cholesterol-lowering medication, that will reduce your risk of having a stroke and the severity of stroke. Uh, they did studies on people who have had strokes or TIAs. They put them on Lipitor, and the group that was on Lipitor was less likely to have a stroke and less severe stroke. So that is one thing you can do is a statin. I think if you've never had a stroke, I think that I would be proactive in that matter. You know, get, have your cholesterol checked. Particularly if it's elevated, I would take, uh, would consider taking a statin. Now, not everybody can tolerate it. You know, like, they'll tell you, oh, don't take that. You know, it'll cause this burning in your legs and stuff like that. Well, that's not everybody, but they can lower the dosage or try something milder. So anyway, I think um, I think I hit the high points here. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I gotta finish up here. So I'm done. 
Uh, <laughs> I feel like I sort of rushed through some of this stuff, but um, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Like, I'm even thinking of like out west where you might be two hours from yeah. the hospital. Yeah. Like, is that something that maybe would be coming down the line in the future? The well, yeah, that is, that, okay, that is being looked into. So um, you might have heard of like telemedicine, okay? So like you could have like a visual monitor in the uh, EMS, let's say you're out in somewhere rural, you could have this on the patient and you could go through like the neural exam, the EMS doc, um, pay, uh, employee could do that and they could determine whether they were eligible or not. Now they would, they, they have, see, Cleveland Clinic, they have these stroke mobile, like they have one or two of them and they have used those, like they can do everything, the CAT scan, the uh, blood work. See, the problem is, like, if you're out in a rural area and you don't have that equipment, those are expensive, those, um, those vans, those mobile things, stroke fields, mobiles. Anyway, those, you have to do, you have to have neuro expertise, so you would have to have a communication with a neurologist. You would have to have, like, a telestroke. But then you'd also have to have a CAT scan to make sure they didn't have a bleed, because if they had a bleed and then you gave them that medication, then that might make them worse, obviously. And then... What else? Oh, the blood work. So, you know, that's the only problem. You know, I know out west sometimes they do um, life flight people, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's one possibility, but that's expensive too. Um, so, no, there isn't any good answer for that. That's the big, big problem is access. Yeah? Which hospital would you go to? Well, I think um, really, um, okay, I don't think you necessarily have to go to a tertiary hospital. So you would go to, um, your hospital that you would go to has to be a, should be a primary stroke center. But let's say you are in a rural area, let's say you're out in Andover, you could go to the emergency room there, they could do a CAT scan, they could do the blood work, they could, they could talk to somebody in stroke and then see if you get the IV TPA and then you could be transferred to another facility. So you can't stay at a stroke ready facility so what, it mean, what does that mean, stroke ready and primary stroke center and comprehensive stroke center? These are all certified by the Joint Commission. So they have to, you have to meet certain criteria. You have to be certified. They come by and they visit you like every two years and then, then you have to, they, they, they read through your records and everything. Um, so stroke ready just means it's an emergency room, a, pu a, a freestanding emergency room. But where would I recommend going? I think that I would not want to go to any place that can't give IV TPA. You know, that would be the minimum. I mean, if you live right next to UH or Cleveland Clinic, I guess you, you might get better care there, but I, you know, you know, might not want to live down there. You know, it's, I, I, think, I think it's reasonable, really, to go to a primary stroke center, and that could be in Lake County, Lake West, Prime, TriPoint, or in Jaga, whatever. Even all these hospitals, Bedford, Richmond, they're all, all set up so that they can give Ahuja. They're all set up so that they can give IV TPA. But they may not be able to keep the patient there if the person actually has like a blockage in an artery that needs to be opened up. But they can transfer you. I mean, they do have ambulances and they can transfer patients. <laughs>